Okay, um, what I want to talk to you about today is, uh, it's a very British theme, uh, Oil Britannia. Um, I'm Steve Sanderson, I'm the um, Executive Chairman and Chief Cook and Bottle Washer of uh, UK Oil and Gas Investments, PLC. Um, I'm, a, I'm an explorer by background, I'm actually a geologist many moons ago. I've uh, drilled about 50 wells and found uh, 24 discoveries. 14 or 15 of them are commercial. Um, and I, um, I want to talk to you about the, the latest discovery I've been involved in and had a big part to play in. Uh, many of you know it as Horse Hill. Um, affectionately, actually originally um, uh, a term of derision and scorn, it was labelled the Gatwick Gusher. But actually, it's actually proved that uh, oil did actually gush to the surface. So, bahu to all those. Um, I think what I, what I want to stress is that um, the, the Gatwick Gusher Horse Hill number one actually contains a completely new type of oil deposit for the United Kingdom. Uh, we, we call this Kimridge Limestone Oil. Um, it has the potential to be very much a game changer for the UK onshore, for UK PLC, and of course for UK oil and gas mints. Um, I should say that uh, UCOG itself is, you know, it's not a one horse hill pony as such. Um, we do have 10 other assets, but I, I really want to focus on this one because everyone, well, hopefully many of you have seen it um, in the media and the press. And um, it's, 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 the, it's our flagship and it's actually the most exciting. It's probably the one that could make the most difference to the company and to Britain. One, one last thing I want to say is that um, everything you're going to see here about the geology and the, and the oil as such is all done without the, uh, the infamous word fracking. We actually use nature to help the, the well actually deliver oil to the surface. So we're not using fracking, not that there's actually anything wrong with that technique, but we won't go into that uh, discussion right now. Okay, what I, what I want to do is actually put, put the whole of the, the Gatwick Gusher into uh, a UK energy um, sort of scene. So to look at the big picture and how it could make an impact actually on, on UK PLC. Um, we, in the UK, uh, we actually, 40% um, of our um, energy demands are met by oil. It's very important to understand that oil actually fulfills a completely different role to gas, coal, nuclear, particularly renewables. We don't use oil to generate electricity. We use oil for transportation. Most importantly, we actually use it for petrochemicals and to make plastics and things like that. that that's fundamental to you know, 21st century and 20th century um, life and, and the, you know, the lifeblood of industrial nations. So. Um, We'll, we'll go on to the next thing. Uh, I, I, I say I want to talk about renewables slightly because um, when we were flow testing our well in uh, February and March, I invited uh, Natalie Bennett, the, um, the head of uh, the, um, the Green Party in the UK, to come and have a look to um, actually see the other side of the fence, see the other side of the argument. And uh, I think she's a very nice lady, but she doesn't really like people like me because she wants to move away from fossil fuels. Um, so she wants everything to move towards renewables. And, and that's great, but we have to understand that renewables generate electricity. Oil is not used for generating electricity. So oil actually fulfills a completely different role from renewables and, and a lot of gas and, and nuclear power. So let, let's look at, you know, it's not an apples-apples um, comparison. All, all renewable technology actually needs oil-based products in order to be able to function. All the cables, they're all coated in, in, in plastics, which, you know, are derived from oil, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I think it's a very important point that people who say, well, we should go away from fossil fuels, we should give up oil, because we all want to be green and, and, and fine and dandy with renewables, I think they completely miss the point. We, we have to have oil, otherwise none of these new technologies will ever work. Uh, there is no substitute for the, the chemicals that are used to make plastics. This, this basically just says, well, you know, frankly speaking, every aspect of our daily lives, more or less, involves oil-based products. Even if we go to electric cars and we use, use that nice 
renewable electricity to power them. You know, the interiors of the cars will be made of plastic. A lot of their bodies will be made of plastic. All the cabling will be covered in plastic. The, the inside, whoops, the inside of your fridge, et cetera, et cetera, will all be made of plastic. So basically, you know, we can't do without it. Uh, we consume in the UK about 1.4 million barrels a day. About 70% of that's used for transportation, land, sea, and air. Uh, but about 30% of it is actually used for petrochemical products. Um, and that, you know, that goes to make the, uh, the plastic. So, so basically what I'm saying is that, um, yeah, we should go and drive electric cars and things like that because it's good for the planet, but we're still going to need oil. We're still going to th need things like the Gatwick Gusher in order to uh, fuel our society. So I, I think, you know, without any oil, uh, you're not going to have any plastics. You, you won't be able to uh, go on a quick uh, sunbreak to the Mediterranean or somewhere like that because no one's yet invented a plane that runs on, on a battery. So... Um, Let's, let's move on. Okay, I think it's very, it's very fundamental that, uh, yes, we need oil for the UK. Um, since 2005, uh, when we were completely self-sufficient in oil, the North Sea, which has provided all that oil, 42 billion barrels have been sucked out of the North Sea. Um, it's now, from 2005, in 10 years, we're now actually importing nearly 40% of the oil. Um, in 2030, we're actually looking at close to 70%. Now, you might say, well, there's a hell of a lot of cheap oil out there. Why don't we, you know, let's just go buy it. That's fine. However, you know, oil provides a very, very significant uh, boost to the economy. And there's a billions of um, tax revenues. It also provides a hell of a lot of jobs. Um, 300,000 odd jobs in the North Sea. That's declining very rapidly with low oil prices. So, you know, UK PLC could do with a shot in the arm with a bit more indigenous oil. So this is where the good old Kimridge oil could come in. Um, basically, uh, I don't know whether you've seen it, but um, extrapolating away from what we think is uh, the potential of the Horse Hill well and that, that discovery, which flowed record uh, amounts of oil to the, uh, the surface, um, if we extrapolate ac across the whole of the south of England, across of the Weald, we can actually get a very significant amount of oil out of the ground and actually a big chunk of our daily oil production. So looking to 2030, EY did a very um, a large sort of economic impact study that was published on Monday. And one of the, you know, they looked at the range of impacts, but ultimately the models they used, we looked at between sort of a mid case and an upper case of about 15 to 27%, you know, perhaps a third of current term um, oil demand. So if you, if you remember going back to here in 2030, you know, we had 70% of oil coming in from outside and, and no benefit from any of those jobs because they're all overseas. We could, if we bring this stuff on, we could actually take a big chunk of that out and get back to where we are in, in current day. So about you know, 30, 40% of oil is only got to be uh, imported. So that you can understand that that's very good for UK or PLC. I've actually been talking to 10 Downing Street. They, they, they like this a lot. Not so much for the, for the energy security per se and security of supply. You can read Amber Rudd's nice, nice political words there. But uh, mostly they like it because it's a big shot in the arm for the economy potentially, and we'll, we'll look at the numbers in a little bit but also because it still generates a lot of jobs. And, you know, jobs in Britain are a, are a good thing for all of us. OK, now, because I'm a geologist, you have to get a geology lesson. And uh, there, there will be an exam at the end. So, so what we call this Kimridge oil. Basically, this is actually a shot down in Dorset on actually Kimridge Bay. That's what gives it its name. Um, the actual rocks that are exposed there on the, on the coast are, in fact, the, the rocks that we drilled into in Horse Hill. They are the Kimridge um, clay, actually they're shales, but the black stuff in there is actually um, it's, uh, composed of little bits of mud and clay, but most importantly, the black bits are um, containing a hell of a lot of fossil organic matter from old algae and plankton. And basically, that stuff is what generates oil. When you cook that in the subsurface, you generate oil from all these old fossil plankton and, and algae. 
The white bits in there are the Kimridge limestones. Um, this geology is very well known. Uh, these rocks are about 500 meters, 1500 foot thick. They cover pretty much from Dorset all the way over to Dover. These same rocks are actually underlie the whole of the North Sea. And uh, the equivalent in the North Sea has generated all the oil that was extracted from, from the North Sea. So 42 billion barrels of oil have been extracted from similar rocks which generated all that oil. If, um, if you come down and you look at that uh, sort of burning barbecue bit in the corner, that if you walk along the beach here, you pick up a bit of the, the Kimbridge clay and you light it, it actually catches fire. That's because it contains small amounts of oil because this stuff has been buried sufficiently deeply to generate a tiny amount of oil. So when you burn it, the oil likes to burn off. So, you know, that, that's a good thing. It shows you there's, there's a prize. So coming here, this is a, a sort of a 3D diagram of the Horse Hill Well down uh, only a few kilometers north of um, Gatwick Airport. You can see that we, uh, we found the same Kimmeridge section, that's, the, um, that's this bit in here, exactly the same down in Dorset, uh, 500 meters thick, lots of the black colored rock, and in the middle of it, these green bits here, those are two bigger limestones. When you come this far east, you actually see 200 foot limestones. Okay, this is very well known. Uh, in the whole of the southeast of England, there's been 150 wells drilled in the last 50 years. So, so you know, what was new? Why, why is this so different? Well, you have to understand that those 150 wells were actually drilled, you know, 30 years or more ago. So, you know, these wells were drilled with 1980s technology. Uh, that's that's pre-Windows and pre-internet. We, we now live in the 21st century, so things have moved on. The other thing about it, actually, and the most crucial thing about it, is that the thoughts that went behind these wells are also 30 years old. So we, we come along, we drill this well, we have the benefit of 21st century technology. We also have the benefit of 21st century knowledge and, 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 um, and understanding of rocks. So, so the big difference, I talked to you about the black rock in there, the Kimridge clay, which generates the oil. Um, the big thing was that until recently, the whole 30-year-old model was that these rocks were never actually buried deep enough to be cooked to actually generate any significant volumes of oil. So all those 150 wells were drilled through it. No one ever looked for the oil. It's bloody hard to find because you need 21st century technology to actually find it and look at it. So no one was really interested in it. We drilled this well, we had very modern data, and we had a, well, I say we, I had a, a light bulb moment uh, in the sense that uh, oil is very much found in the minds of men, right? It's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a scientific and, and thought process. What this well showed was that actually these rocks, this Kimridge, these black rocks had actually been buried well deep enough to generate a lot of oil. In fact, as they say in Texas, a shitload of oil. Um, so billions potentially. And that, when you make that thought jump, when you, when, you make, when you have that light bulb moment, you think, well, okay, all this Kimridge is actually probably full of oil. What does it do? Well, you know, it sits in these rocks unless it can go somewhere else. Where can it go? Well, actually, it can go directly into these Kimridge limestones. The Kimridge limestones themselves, as you can understand, are quite brittle. They're limestones like the, like, like the, um, the White Cliffs of Dover. They are, in fact, chalks, just like the White Cliffs of Dover. So this represents a really nice, nice target for drilling because um, oil can flow in it because it's naturally fractured. You don't have to frack it. You can't frack it because it's too, too shallow anyway. So when you think about that, you think, OK, it's worth looking at. It's worth spending some money to actually try and find out how much oil there is in there. Now, as I said, that's a very, very difficult thing to do because it requires very new technology that actually has really only been developed in the last 10 years or so in the United States by smart people, people like New Tech and Schlumberger, where you can actually look at, look at the results from the well and you can actually calculate 
the amount of oil that actually sits in the well and the, and the area surrounding the, um, the well itself. Now, the first thing we did, we looked at Horse Hill. Uh, last April, we announced big numbers. Basically, it said that um, in the 55 square miles around the, the Horse Hill well itself in the licenses that we have there, there was actually 11 billion barrels, mostly all of it in the Kimmeridge clay, in those black colored rocks and uh, some others deeper down in the section. What was crucial was that there was actually also, in those two limestones, the upper and the lower limestones, there was a billion barrels of oil sitting in those 55 square miles. Now, if you use analogs from the United States, um, it's possible that you can think about getting between about 3 and 13%. We thought about 15% of that oil actually out of the ground. So, you know, 5%, 10% of a billion barrels is still a very large number of oil and, and very, very significant for the UK in itself. We then let uh, New Tech go wild with their technique and we looked at every well in this basin, so 130 plus wells. And then they came up with a staggering figure of oil actually in the ground, in the wheel, at 124 billion barrels or in about 20 billion in the Kimmeridge. So a very, very big prize. So this is still very much a science project. We're in business to make money. We have to get the oil out of the ground, up to the surface and to refinery to actually make any money. So what we did to try and transform this from science project to reality, we actually tested this well in, in February and March. We actually, uh, you can see there the two Kimmeridge limestone zones. They're all above this UK-wide frack ceiling of 1,000 metres, so you can't legally frack it anyway. We didn't, we didn't need it. And I can honestly say that, you know, I, as I said, I've been involved in, um, in 24 or so discoveries, some of them very, very large. But this is actually the most exciting and actually the most surprised I've ever been in any, any test result of any well. This actually came in well, well above any of our expectations. What, we, what this was designed to do is actually to test the presence, our hypothesis, the light bulb moment that there was actually liquid movable oil down in these limestones. We always thought we'd have to come back and drill another type of well, a horizontal well in there, to actually get it out to flow to the surface. But this, the, these came out at record rates. It's actually, if you look at the whole aggregate, stable dry oil rate is actually the highest flow rate of any onshore discovery well in the entire history of the UK onshore. Um, we got the highest uh, for any individual horizon being the upper Kimmeridge limestone, the first flow of any oil from the lower Kimmeridge limestone and actually the Portland on the top, which is very nice but sort of beer and sandwiches in comparison to the Kimmeridge limestone. That was actually the record, the highest flow of anything from the Portland. So as I said, we're in, we're in business to make money, so uh, it's nice having a flow test, and they're only for a fairly short period. We'll be going back fairly soon and actually testing them over a long-term production test, about 30, well, 90 days over each of the zones. Um, we clearly need to uh, get this into production, so we, we, um, we basically have commissioned some studies, and, and the way that we can do this, all of these, um, or well, say at Horse Hill, it's about a six-acre six site. Um, what we plan to do, and it's a model that's developed in the United States, is you basically pack a lot of wells into these small sites. We've, we plan 12 to 24 wells um, in these sites, and um, we deliberately, because it's the southeast of England and it's a place I live in, in the Weald, it's very beautiful, we decided that we were going to make these as low impact and as low visual profile as possible. So we site, we'll site all the wells and the pumps below ground. Um, we'll uh, actually control all the production uh, to actually reduce the, um, the initial road impact because what we have to do in order to get this to, uh, to market initially, we'll have to tanker the, uh, the oil out. From the, the flow test, we actually sent 14 tankers of oil to the Forley refinery. We actually produced a few thousand barrels of oil somewhere on the ground. I have a small barrel, but it's rolling away. Oh, there it is. This is a, a, Gat, a Gatwick um, droplet from the Gatwick gusher. It's from the, um, from the, the lower Kimmeridge. 
So basically the idea is that over the wheeled area, over our licenses and then over a bigger area, we'll put these um, six, four to six um, acre sites. Uh, going back to the EY study, the, the, ups, you know, the, the large case was about 100 of these sites. And you have to understand that um, they're all in sort of wooded territory within the, um, the wheel. So you basically, you won't be able to see them from, from the road. The, the good thing when I said to you about the Kimridge extending over such a huge area is that because this is a sort of ubiquitous type of deposit, it goes over a massive area, you know, 1,500 square miles, you can actually site all your locations, your, your development pads, your production sites, uh, perhaps in brownfield areas. You can certainly cherry pick and put them away from villages, from housing. Uh, you can put them by major roads. Um, if you get enough of them, you could probably have a small railhead. So I think th this can be done very, um, very low profile in keeping with the, with the whole area of the wheel itself. This, this just basically shows an overview of a conceptual diagram of, uh, of the wheel and shows that basically the only thing that you can really see above surface few, from a few, apart from a few porter cabins, are actually the oil storage tanks, which are about the same size as a grain silo. So you, know, you can paint them green or you can paint them white or you can paint them red or whatever, but, but you can actually make them blend into the local environment. Okay. Um, as I mentioned to you before, the, uh, the EY report basically was looking at what really is the size of the prize for, for not only for UCOG, but particularly for, for UK um, PLC. I think uh, when, you, when you look at the range, it's clear that you can get up to you know, about 15 to maybe 30% of um, UK daily oil demand, you know, a few hundred thousand to 300,000 barrels a day maybe in 10 to 15 years over, over these sites. And I should add, if, I forgot to say that um, if you have 100 of these six acre sites, that's 600 acres, one square mile is 640 acres. So one square mile in, in 1,500 square miles is actually a very small percentage. So the actual physical impact of the area is, is very, very small. I think the, as I said to you, number 10 Downing Street are very interested this, in this. I guess the, the Treasury are very interested in it because potentially it gives them a lot of billions to, to play with over the next you know, 15, 20 years. And the, and the lifespan of these wells would be you know, 20, 30, perhaps even 40 years. But actually the, the most important thing and the whole concept behind energy security as far as I'm concerned is the fact that we need oil. It's much better if we have it ourselves because basically we actually get the economic value from it and it creates a lot of jobs. You can see that um, over, over the sort of averaged over the life of the, uh, over the project, we get between 1,000 and you know, 5,000 jobs. When, when, um, when you start doing these things, clearly the number of jobs will be a lot, lot higher in the, initial, in the initial time. But I think you know, the number 10 are really interested in this because basically it, gi it potentially gives the UK a lot of jobs, and uh, you know that's good for that's good for everybody. Um, where are we? Okay, we won't we won't look at this one, but I think um, I think I have a I have a very um, we have a very uh, well defined um, strategy as to how to move this forward to actually make UCOG a very serious player in the UK. Um, and also, you know, to, 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 to help the UK economy itself. What we're trying to do over the next months to a couple of years is basically push Horse Hill towards actually having a few production wells there. From that, we learn exactly what we need to do in, in new sites over the area. Um, we're also going to be um, acquiring more acreage over the basin because we want to be the number one player in this, um, in this new type of oil um, deposit in the, in the UK. We, um, we're going to be involved in drilling some new exploration wells, which will actually prove up this play that we can, we can say, well, actually now we can um, have carbon copies, if you like, of Horse Hill. We can replicate what we see in Horse Hill over various parts in the basin, and therefore 
we, we know that we're in business to actually then focus in a couple of years' time on actually going from this sort of proof of concept and actually proving up um, it's commercially viable to actually then going into a development and production phase, which is a very, very different type of business. So hopefully by that time, we'll actually be you know, the largest player in the basin. We'll be in a nice position where we've de-risked everything. And then we can think about, OK, do we bring somebody else in who has the money to, because clearly we'll need a hell of a lot of capital in order to drill all the wells that are needed. And um, you know, may, may, maybe um, we'll, um, we'll have a, you know, a major come in who has the money and the technique to do it, or maybe we'll actually look to fund it ourselves. But I think I, I'm looking to stay in this, certainly for the medium to long term. This is very much, we're, we're a British company. This is, you know, we found British oil. And I think we're, we're very committed to staying in there and, and, and keeping it British. I, I just want to say that this is actually very much the start of our journey over the next couple of years. Um, as I said to you, we have a very clear strategy to become the number one player, de-risk, and then go into a very wide sort of uh, production and development phase. So all I can say to you, if you'd like to be part of our journey, please go and buy some Hugh Cog stock. <laughs>